of the Holy Word. Today's scripture is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. I'll read verses 14 through 25. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with him. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you hand, <clears throat> handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Thank you. It's good to be together in God's house this morning. Let's pray as we continue in worship. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for the ways in which we have already felt and known your presence here with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray now that you will guide the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts to you so that they might be pleasing in your sight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Investments, accounting, settling accounts, interest, bankers, all terms associated with what? Money, right? And while this parable, as we understand it, is about a great deal more than just what we do with our financial resources, I think it's important for us to focus on this element of money that we see. Because when Jesus is talking to the disciples, they would have understood a talent differently from how we might think of a talent. We might think of a talent as a gift or an ability or our God-given um, ability to, to share God's love and very particular ways to who we are as God's children, but a talent was a lot of money. And I've read different people say different things, but a talent was anywhere between 10 to 20 years of a day laborer's wages. So when we hear that someone is given five talents by their master, that's more than a lifetime worth of work, right? That is a lot of money that that person has been entrusted with. And the same with two. And even if we start to feel bad for the third guy who only got one talent, we still know that that is a considerable amount of money that he was entrusted by his master. And so when I think about these things, I can't help but get my palms get a little sweaty because I think about these investments. We don't know how long the master's gone, and I am not a financial planner. I don't know if y'all know that, but I'm not. Um, just making sure you guys know that. But I imagine that it took a lot of risk to make five talents, ten talents, right? I mean, if you think about how we invest and how we use our resources, that would involve a great deal of risk. And so that makes me so nervous to think about that, especially if the money's not mine to begin with and I go trying to, to make more money with it. So I typically identify with the third servant. And the poor third servant, I'll continue reading um, for us as we finish out this scripture. This is the master's response to the third servant when he gives back what is the master's. 
His master replied, this is verse 26, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, but gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have with an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. My goodness, aren't we glad we stopped the reading earlier at a less um, terrifying point, right? Because then we would have had to say the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, thanks be to God, right? But we are thankful for it. Um, and we'll, we'll get more into that in a little while. But I think what Jesus is inviting the disciples into with this parable. And let's remember that the, the work that Jesus is calling his disciples to is risky work, and this is all happening during Holy Week. So Jesus is on a very high-risk venture himself. He is in Jerusalem. He is sharing with his disciples. He has come, and he is turning the world upside down with this language of the kingdom of God and what that's going to look like. And it's going to look different from any powers that the world had already experienced. And it looks different from the powers that we experience today as well. And this is one of four parables that Jesus tells about his anticipated second coming. He's going to go away, right? He's going to die on the cross at the end of this week. And he's going to be risen from the dead. And then he's going to return. And so these four parables that he tells are all about when he comes back. The story right before this is about the, the bridesmaids or the ten virgins, and they are awaiting the groom to come so that they can celebrate a wedding, right? And maybe you know this story. Five of them have enough oil to last them until the groom comes, but five are not prepared. And so when the groom comes, the five who didn't have enough oil are out buying oil. So when they get back, they're locked out of the celebration. And so it's a parable of being aware and prepared for whenever this day come when Christ might come back. And here today, I think what Jesus wants his disciples to hear is that there is work that they need to be doing. They need to be investing in the kingdom of God. So while they would have heard this in terms of, of money, I think they would have understood it in terms of, of all of the things that they do and where they invest their time and their energy, and they would have seen that that's a risky thing that Jesus is asking them to do, because Jesus was doing a risky thing himself. Jesus, after all, invested in 12 men, right? He had a lot of crowds around him at a lot of different times, but most of his time was spent with 12 men. And one of those guys didn't work out so well, right? I mean, not to put it lightly, but he invested in 12 men. He poured his heart and soul into them so that they would be able to share his message when Jesus was no longer with them. And I can't imagine how Jesus probably would just get, I think, probably frustrated with them when he kept trying to tell them what he was trying to do, and they just didn't get it, right? There's so many times when they just didn't see what he was planning to do. And so I think this scripture is to make them aware that they are to be doing good work, that they are to be investing in the kingdom of God. So what is it, if it's not just money and if it's not just gifts and talents that we are to be, what is it that we're entrusted with? What was it that Jesus had given to the disciples? Jesus had given himself. He'd given the news of the coming kingdom of God. He was going to give the Holy Spirit. So he had given each and every one of them these very, very precious gifts. He had entrusted these wonderful words of salvation and hope to the disciples. And since Jesus hasn't come back yet, that's the same thing that Jesus entrusts us with today. The church is to, to usher in God's kingdom. We are to point people to God and to what God's will is for the world. What does that look like? What does that mean? In scripture, we see that God is always fighting for those who are not seen or heard, for the needy, for the oppressed. God is always on the side of the oppressed, right? And so we see how in the Bible, the things that Jesus is doing are turning this world and the powers of this world upside down. 
And so the church, when there is oppression, when there are people who are on the margins, when there are people who are vulnerable, who are crying out for help, the church has to be the body that allows, that hears that, and that works for change in our world. We have a big task, don't we, as the church? And then individually, we've all been entrusted with an experience of God, I would bet that every single one of us is in here today because somehow we have experienced the power of God. Whether through worship, whether through a personal encounter that you've had, whether through nature, every one of us has had some experience of God, and that's why we're here. So God has given each of us a story of our experience of who God is. Each one of us has a story to share. Each one of us has a testimony to give. I don't know if you know that, but we all have one. And then we all have gifts and talents and graces that have been given us, given to us by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we might invest in God's kingdom and stop spending so much time and energy investing in the things of this world. And so maybe if you are blessed with financial gifts, we take a look at how and how and what we're giving towards, right? Or if you are a good listener, maybe that is your spiritual gift. And let me tell you, people often underestimate the power of listening. And I've heard people say, you know, well, I don't really think I have any gifts, but I'm a good listener. That is such an important gift. You know why? Because this world is so loud there, there's chaos, there is noise, people are talking at each other all the time. Have you noticed that? We're talking at each other, and there are people who need and want to be heard. And so if you are a good listener, the most important thing that you can do is listen to someone and show them that they are valued and appreciated, that they are seen and heard. That is so important, and we underestimate that so often. But that is investing in the kingdom of God. Maybe you invest in in the, hopefully you invest in the children's ministry here and in the youth ministry here and in all of the wonderful ministries because we are working together to bring about the kingdom of God. One thing that I think is important about this scripture is that the, the response that the master gives to the person with five talents and two talents is the exact same response, right? I'd like to think that if the guy with one talent had it taken the risk and invested his talent, that the words would have been the same from the master. I think that's how that parable is, why it's laid out that way. It's because it's not that we are to compare our gifts with someone else or what God has given to us, but it's because we are called to trust God. And if we trust God with what we've been given, if we take risks and invest in the kingdom of God, then we will be rewarded just as much as someone else who may have more things or different abilities from us. One of the other main points of this passage is the fear, right? The fear that the third servant has that causes him to be paralyzed and not be able to, to respond and do with um, the things he had been given what the master would have wanted him to do. And I think about us, and I think about in my own life, what is it that I'm fearful of? What is it that keeps me burying my gifts or my graces or my talents or my resources in the ground? What is it? What am I afraid of? And then, as someone who is not one to take risks, I'm not a risk taker. I don't even like roller coasters. I don't, you know, I'm, I like to keep my feet on the ground, and, and I don't really like the unknown very much. What am I afraid of? Why? Is it so hard to take risks for the kingdom of God? Why is it so hard to put myself out there, to put ourselves out there and stand up for what God would want for us? I think these are questions that we all have to ask ourselves at some point. Our scripture also reminds us that there will be judgment. And that was the, the portion that I read um, a few minutes ago. And... I don't really like to talk about judgment. You're not going to find many Methodists who are going to preach sermons on judgment. <laughs> it's, just not, it's just not how we feel like we should spend our time. But there will be a day when we have to account for the things we've done and the things that we've left undone. There will be a day when we have to look at what we've invested in and what risks we've taken for the kingdom of God. And we'll have to be accountable for those and take responsibility for those. And I think my main problem with this idea of judgment is that so often it is used to instill fear 
whether, meaning, whether someone is meaning to or not, that's a fearful thing for us to think of, isn't it? This idea of being judged. But I think it's important for us to remember that when we are judged, Christ is there advocating for us. When we're judged, we are seen through the lens of God's love and what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. That's a much different version of judgment to me because, yes, we'll be held accountable and we have to be responsible, but we don't have to be fearful. We need to make sure that we are investing in the kingdom of God and that we are doing what God would have us do. I think one of the reasons why we don't invest in the kingdom of God is because we don't understand or believe that the kingdom of God is a kingdom of abundance. And it's not abundance like this world might teach us that abundance should be. It's not going to be more money or more stuff um, or more status. But the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, there is an abundance of love. There is an abundance of a sense of belonging. There are all these wonderful gifts that come with the kingdom of God. I'm not a huge fan of the question, if you died today, do you know where you'd go? Um, again, I think sometimes, while I don't necessarily disagree with the theological purpose of that question, but oftentimes I feel like when it is asked, it is asked in a way to scare us into something that we might not otherwise believe, or that's how I've heard it used before. But I wonder today, when Jesus comes back, we don't know when it will be, we don't know on what day that will happen. I wonder what Jesus will say to us. My prayer is that God will say to John's Creek United Methodist, that Jesus will say to us as individuals, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. I believe that will be what will be said. But my question for us today is what risks are we willing to take? I'm not talking about base jumping or skydiving or any of those things that I would never be caught doing. But who are we willing to reach out to? Who are we willing to invest in? What are we willing to do and say and stand up for that is going to make the kingdom of God known here and now? And as we go about the life of the church, as we work together to grow in our understanding of God and neighbor, I pray that we will hold each other accountable and responsible to this task of investing in the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Loving and gracious God, again, we thank you for this time. God, we thank you that you have entrusted the message of the gospel to us. We thank you that you have given all of us gifts and graces and abilities to be able to share this good news with the world. God, I pray that we will take risks. I pray that we will step out of our comfort zone. I pray that you will open our eyes and ears and hearts and minds to ways in which we might continue to work to invest in your kingdom. Don't let us get sidetracked by the powers of this world, but let us always be looking to use our energy and efforts and resources to bring about your kingdom here and now. God, we long for the day when you will return and you will make things right. And God, we know that that day is still coming. And so God, allow us to do your work and your will in this world. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <coughs>